areas because there is a lot of content that we want to get covered. So I'm going to skip through the outline. <clears throat> um, probably the first and foremost thing is to talk about because CPT is so wrapped around physician payment. Um, the Social Security Act requires that CMS establish payment under a physician fee schedule. And that payment is based on CPT codes. The um, Harvard study that was done probably, I think it was like 1997 or so, they actually, it was just before that, um, they came up with a methodology that is still being used today. And it consists of what's called resource-based relative value unit system. Now it has progressed to just RVUs. It consists of work, practice expense, and malpractice expense. Um, the AMA is kind of an offshoot of that um, because they are the um, developers of codes representing physician services. So they have what is called the RUC, which is the Relative Value Scale Update Committee. And what the RUC does is it looks at the CPT codes and how much work is associated with performing that service. The physician work is a component of the technical skill, physical effort required to perform it, the mental effort and judgment, time to perform, and psychological stress. Um, and the way the AMA gets information on, um, from its members and from the specialty societies is that they send out surveys <clears throat> historically you know, surveys, people just don't respond to it, and a lot of physicians will ne never respond to one. And the minimum requirement, I was kind of shocked when I saw this, but if you have a service that's performed a million times, they need to get at least 75 physicians to complete the survey on that particular service. For 100,000 services, it's only 50 physicians. So you can tell that the response rate isn't that great. What they've done is created it to be online. So it is um, much easier, but there still is a lot of hesitancy. The annual adjustments. George, um, George Ann? Sorry. Yeah. Hi, this is Mary. Are you advancing the slides? Because we're still all seeing slide one on the screen. I am advancing the slides. Uh-oh, so we're having a technical difficulty. <laughs> hmm. Okay, um, can you, you want me to start over? Well, I think everyone's been tracking with what you've been saying, but I didn't know if you wanted to test and see if you could move the slides forward and back, because we're just not seeing it. Okay, can you see it now? Changing? N nope. Let me that is um, try stop sharing and reshare. Yeah, that's what I would recommend. If you could stop sharing for a moment and then reshare your, and you may end up having to share your screen instead of sharing the application. But yeah, I never had to do this before. So how's this? Hmm? Now do well, you see the now we're seeing. Yep. Okay. Yep, and we can see your app. Okay, great. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Right. Instant panic. <laughs> okay. Um, All right. So I'm going to go back on mute. But thank you to everyone who gave us a heads up on the on the questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The RBRBS valuation. Um, they make annual adjustments. And the one thing that is new for this year is that it's always included the sustainable growth factor rate. Um, they are now not using that anymore. They are now establishing what's called a target. Um, the merit-based incentive payment system, which is MIP, M-I-P-S, um, that was a requirement of a Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015. The long and the short of it is that they are now setting targets and it is all based financially and so what they're saying is that okay the sustainable growth would have been this that's gone 
saying that we only want to see a, and you can see for target uh, 2016, a 1% growth. So what that means is it's whatever the target is set at, it's going to filter down into the position payment. Um, oh, I think I did that back. Okay, they, um, part of the rules that have come out is that they want to make very much a transparency in the rate setting. So all of the proposed changes in rate in, inputs are published in the proposed rules. There's a 60-day comment period, and then they will go ahead and, and after the comment period, they will put the rates into effect. I'm kidding. Um, the conversion factor for 2016 is $35.82.879. Um, it is a 10.6 cent increase from 2015. The components of it is that there was a 0.29% decrease from the 2015 rate, a 0.5 increase um, due to that macro, which I, is what I just called, um, referred to a 0 0.77 decrease due to a target, and a 0 point minus 0 0.2 negative budget neutrality adjustment. For 2016, these are the effective dates. The comment period goes from October 30th through December 29. Um, November 1 was the final rule, and then January 1 for the following year well, some of the changes will be in effect. Some of the key things, and there's a couple of things here that I really wanted to point out. Global surgery is one of the biggest ones. In 2017, the 10-day global period is being eliminated to be zero days. And in 2018, there will no longer be a 90-day global period. Um, I have no idea where that's going. Um, but it's going to have a huge impact on a lot of providers. Some of it good. I'm sure some of it will not be good. The biggest change that is going to affect providers this year is in, in the physician payment rule is the incident to provision. Last year, it said that the incident to services had to be performed by individuals who were licensed um, to perform those services. This year, the big thing is the billing physician must be the same physician who is the supervising physician. Um, that is a huge. That's going to have a huge impact on multiple, multiple physician practices. Services cannot be provided by an individual who's been excluded from Medicare, Medicaid, or another federal program. And then, if they have been disenrolled from Medicare for any reason, or their enrollment has been revoked services cannot be provided, which is going to be, because um, some of the providers that have gotten excluded, they will work in a physician's office under the incident to provision, um, and they are not allowed to do that anymore. So they are really excluded completely from performing any health care service. The phase-in for the RV reductions beginning in 2016, the statute requires that the RVUs get decreased by 20%, greater than 20%. Statute requires reduction of total RVUs greater than 20%, and that it will be anything that is reduced to that amount will be phased in over two years. It does not apply to new or revised codes, and the reduced rates in the first year um, is up to 19%, and then any additional amount will be taken in the second year. Um, the big thing in radiation oncology, even though there were new codes developed, they are still going to continue using the G codes predominantly because I think that they want to collect um, a lot of information on cost and pricing. There are no new code sets for 2016. Um, and they'll continue to use the G codes. Uh, CT services are being reduced by 5% in 2016 and 15% in 2017. 
Um, there have been, again, always the work on the misvalued codes, and over a 1,000 codes were reviewed and revised this year. Um, this is the same slide that I use you know, pretty much every year about how they define a misvalued code. So I am not necessarily going to re go through all of them again. Some of the key factors are the ones that um, if there's a new code and it's the highest growth, if it's also a very expensive um, code where there is not only high use of it, but the payment for it is very high, particularly in the practice expense area. And I think that as you see more and more of the freestanding radiation oncology centers and a lot of centers that are going to be billed on the Part B um, CMS 1500, that's where you're going to see in them focusing on misvalued codes. Um, codes that um, are new technology codes and then where there are multiple codes that occur at the same time in performing a single service. It's very much like the C, you know, comprehensive APC packaging that you see. You're also going to be doing that on the professional side. Um, any of the new codes are being valued based on the Harvard um, RBRBS approach. Um, the value-based payment modifier, the VM, reflects both quality and cost of care. The interesting thing that is out this year, the VM is applied at the tax payer, the tax ID number. So if you have any anybody in the practice and it is all billed under one tax ID number and um, there are individuals within the practice who have not reached the goal requirements for the PQRS, everybody suffers. So um, for this year, the register as a group um, and meet the criteria to avoid a 2018 PQRS payment adjustment, or individuals within a group um, can register, and at least 50% of the providers in the group have to report if the group fails to register, they'll receive an automatic 2% um, downward adjustment. So for 2016, it applies to groups of 10 or more eligible professionals. Um, and if they, and this is the 2% reduction, um, is based on the services that were provided, um, the quality indicators reported for services provided in 2014. Um, for calendar year 2017, it's based on solo of, or groups of two or more, and it's going to be based on 2015 data. So by 2018, everybody's going to be under it, um, and they will use quality reporting data from 2016. For 2016, there were 272 Category 1 changes really 110 new codes, which at the CPT Annual Symposium um, put on by the AMA, it felt like there was hardly anything going on. A lot of the um, presentations were basically saying that there were no changes. This is a table that kind of summarizes where the changes were. I kind of, um, obviously, for the sake of size, you'll see under respiratory, I threw in the inhalation code in the 90,000 series. Same thing with digestive, nervous system, the neural stimulators. Just to make give you an idea of where the changes are. And if you see, it's lab, radiology made the new codes. Um, those are the biggest areas. <clears throat> and then the revisions. And most of the revisions occurred again in radiology. Um, mostly because they're getting rid of code, you know, re reorganizing, restructuring, and then um, you'll see that there were 87 deletions where in radiology specifically there um, are being included in other codes. Under the surgery section, there were a lot of changes uh, made starting with the expansion of the guidelines and that include instructions for the use of 
imaging guidance. Um, soft tissue marker placement with imaging guidance. Um, if a more specific site descriptor is applicable, like the breast codes, you're supposed to use the specific site codes first. The two new codes, the 10035 and the 10036, were established in the skin, subcutaneous, and accessory structure section um, to report initial and additional lesion placement of soft tissue localization markers, basically. Um, it can be a clip, metallic pellet, wire needle, radioactive C. The problem is that a lot of these patients are on chemotherapy. And while they're on therapy, if they don't have the marker placed ahead of time and the tumor shrinks, then they're un unable to find it. So they put the marker in ahead of time so that they can track it. Um, they then use imaging codes to identify where the markers are. From a documentation, just side note, um, the radiologists really need to document well. When they do the imaging, they, sometimes they use a handheld scanner to identify where the marker is. They need to make a mention that the marker was when the marker was placed so that um, somebody um, knows that it gives them credit for the full service. It would be appropriate to report the 10036 for second procedure on the same side or the contralateral side. In the musculoskeletal section, um, CBT 921805 was eliminated. Um, it's for the open treatment of a rib fracture without fixation. Nobody does that anymore. So um, it has been deleted, uh, no, no change in, you know, big change in technology. In current practice, it's just treated. Um, with either a belt or um, if it's really severe, they'll have to go in and do it open. Um, the 22856 has been uh, changed uh, to the total disc arthroscopy, artificial disc enter approach, including and it lists all of the things that are included, the single inner space. Uh, cervical, and this is a resequence code. Sorry, it's not a new one. For endoscopic procedures, um, the bronchoscopy codes have changed. And as you can see, the 31622 through 31651, 31660, um, all of them now include fluoroscopic guidance when performed. The 31652 and 31653 are complete services used for sampling, aspiration, or biopsy, lymph nodes, or adjacent structures, um, utilizing an endobronchial ultrasound. That is the EBUS acronym. And they're reported separately. And then CPT 31654 is an add-on code and should be reported for identifying one or more peripheral lesions with trans endoscopic guidance. And it's to be listed separately in addition to the code for the primary service. Cardiovascular, there's five new codes for transcatheter leadless pacemaker services. There's also new introductory guidelines, um, cross-references to new, a new code added with the addition of a note following the 37197. And then there are those dreaded exclusionary parenthetical notes. And there's one following the 93566. The transcatheter laidless pacemaker is kind of a cool thing. Um, it's a pace, you know, when you think about it, a pacemaker system is with leads that include a pulse generator, um, and there's electronics and a battery and one or more leads, and then a lead, lead consists of one or more electrodes, along with conductor wires, um, insulation, fixation mechanism, and then the pulse generators are placed in a subcutaneous pocket. It's either in a subdicular area or um, just above the abdominal muscles below the rib cage. 
and then the leads are inserted through a vein um, or they can be placed on the surface of the heart. With the leadless um, cardiac pacemaker system, the device is approximately about an inch long and it weighs two grams, which I checked to see what the real ounce size was, and it's obviously 0 0.7. You can see the conversion there. And it actually sits inside in the apex of the right ventricle. It is passed through um, a vein and with a catheter sheet, and it's passed right either right into the atrium, um, right atrium or the ventricle. Um, and it just sits there and like Bluetooth te technology transmits the um, signals. So removal of it is not as easy as the insertion. And it probably, um, I think they noted that it is much more difficult um, and in that instance, there would have to be um, another approach used to remove it. Um, gastroenterology. A um, lot of uh, discussion about the fundoplasty and different approaches that are being done. The endo, um, esophageal gastro, gas, esophagoscopy subsection includes two new flexible Trans, sorry, um, trans, um, so trans nasal esophagoscopy codes. Um, the trans nasal esophagoscopy is performed to evaluate um, from the inlet, obviously through the nose, um, down to the gastroesophageal junction. The nasal cavity, the nasal pharynx, uh, hypopharynx, and larynx are all examined when they do this transnasal approach. Um, there is a sunset category two code being um, uh, expiring ERCP with optical microendoscopy, microsurgery, and liver elastography, and oversight of artificial liver therapy. In the fundoplasty section, um, fundoplication is a procedure for patients with chronic gastroesophageal reflux disease GERDs who cannot be managed with conventional pharmacological management and medical uh, measures. So CPT code 43210 is for a partial um, or complete esophagogastric fundoplasty and includes a duodenoscopy when performed. The esophagogastric fundoplasty is performed by a transoral approach, so it goes through the mouth and is different from the traditional fundoplasty performed by either a laparotomy or thoracotomy or laparoscopically. Um, because of the difference in the procedures, there was really no mechanism in the past to report these. So this allows the new reporting. It is an anti-reflux procedure. The 43210 includes the esophagoscopy. It um, is usually an overnight stay, although it is not on the um, midnight inpatient-only procedure list. Um, it's under either a general anesthesia or MAC. It has a current. 10-day global period, and it can be performed by either a gastroenterologist or a general surgeon. Um, there's a new category 3 code, 0392P. It's a laparoscopic surgical esophageal sphincter augmentation procedure, which is a magnetic band that um, allows they come together, if you think about two magnets, and it's the placement of these beaded chains around the lower end of the esophageal sphincter, and they, you know, stick together. Can't see my hands doing that, but it's used for patients with a small hiatal hernia, not ones that have a huge one that they would do surgery for. And it's not for the most severe grades of esophagitis, um, but this bead change chain expands when food goes down, and it does allow you to um, 
he described it as belching, and I like the word burping better. Um, and the 0393T is for the removal of the device. There is esophageal balloon distension study. Um, this is a is generally measured in patients who undergo esophageal um, have um, strictures. Um, not all patients undergoing the provocation, which used to be part of the code. Um, it was required. It no longer requires the performance of the provocation. It was revised to allow reporting for studies performed to measure the tissue properties. It uses a balloon catheter with a barostat, which is kind of like a barometer kind of thing. It measures the, it's called distendability, how much can it distend of the esophageal lumen when they do an inflation or deflation of the balloon, and it is considered. Um, the word diagnostic was added to clarify that the study is strictly diagnostic. It's unlike when they do the um, pass the various catheters down to, um, I can't think of the word right now, but it's um, make it wider, the esophagus wider, because there's a stricture. Under ERCP, um, there are a number of changes. The ERC, ERCP with stent placement includes the black balloon dilatation performed in the duct. Um, the ERCP with with more than one stent placement, so if there are different ducts or they're side by side in the same duct and is performed during the same day or session, can be reported with the 43274 more than once with the modifier 59 appended to the subsequent procedures. For the ERCP with more than one stent exchanged during the same session, the 43276 may report it for the initial stent exchange, and then the 43276 with modifier 59 for each additional stent exchange, which is kind of unlike some of the other stenting procedures. The ERCP with um, the balloon dilatation of more than one duct during the same day, same session, can be reported with the 59 appended to the subsequent procedure. And then if there is a sphincteroplasty, which is the balloon dilatation of the ampulla, the sphincter of Adi, um, it's reported with the 43277 and includes the sphincterotomy, um, the 43262, when performed. Code 0397T is in category 3, um, endoscopic retrograde cholangeal pancreatography with optical endomicroscopy. It's listed separately in addition to the code for the primary um, procedure. It's used in conjunction with the 43260, 61, 62, 64, 74, 76, 77, and 78, which are the ERCP codes. You would not report it with the 8837 five code for optical microscopic imaging interpretation and report. Um, liver elastography, this is a, surprisingly, this is a code that was in 2015, it was established to identify um, the elastography performed via mechanically induced shear wave technique, like vibrations. Um, the procedure includes the interpretation and report, but does not include imaging. Um, it measures the stiffness of the liver via elastography and is one of a number of methods used to identify the presence of conditions such as advanced liver fibrosis, cirrhosis of the liver in patients with chronic liver disease. Um, the 91200 measures the degree of fibrosis. And what's really important about this is that it stages the status of the disease. Um, and what they found is that the insurers and pharmacy benef benefit administrators um, 
for the medication, the um, DAA, which is used to treat the liver fibrosis, um, the cost can, is, can run from 40000 to 140000 um, They want to make sure that it's being um, used at the correct stage of the disease. The thing is that it has a 95% cure rate, so um, it's pretty awesome. <coughs> um, liver assist system, um, CPT0405T was established to report the oversight of a patient who is on the liver assist, assist system. Um, it is uh, extracorporeal and it's kind of like a dialysis for the liver. Um, the code tracks the enrollment of the patients in a clinical trial and the 0405T describes 30 minutes or more of non-face-to-face -face time that um, is spent on the oversight of the system. The patient um, is separate. It's not part of critical care or any other E&M service, but it's the development and revision of a care plan. It's the review of the reports of the patient's status. Um, if there is a change in the patient's status and the revision of the care plan, um, monitoring lab results, communicating with other healthcare providers, family members, and um, any other key individuals in the caring of the patient is involved in this code. Um, and the new, inter new information is integrated into the patient's treatment plan for adjustment in therapy. It's because it's fairly new, there is not a Category 1 code for it. There were a lot of changes in the transcatheter procedure section. Um, the 37184 and 86 have been revised to include the non-intracranial uh, transcatheter procedures. So it, you'll notice that it um, contains just about everything except the kitchen sink. Um, for the 37184, it's for the initial vessel, and the 37185 is for um, each sub uh, second and all subsequent vessels within the same vascular family, and it's listed in addition to the primary mechanical thrombectomy. And then there are a lot of exclusionary, and there were so many underneath them that I just put down at the bottom, do not report the 37184, 785, and 86 in conjunction with the laundry list of other codes. And they are after each code. I just did a summary for the sake of um, space. Um, intracranial intravascular uh, interventions. Uh, code 64412 is for the uh, Introduction, injection of an anesthetic agent into the spinal accessory nerve has been deleted down here and has been, um, there's a cross-reference and a parenthetical note saying that um, it has been deleted and it refers you to another section. In um, the CPT 644 uh, injection anesthetic trigeminal nerve, any division or branch, you can see how it's been broken out and they would not be, um, obviously, the 644. And if the service is being provided, you use the 64999 code. Um, vascular territories, that was a new term. Um, there are parenthetic notes in the endovascular section that describe how CPT has divided the intracranial arteries into three vascular territories. There's the right carotid circulation, the left carotid circulation, and the vertebral vascular circulation. CPT <clears throat> 61645 may be reported once for each intracranial vascular territory treated. Um, 61650 is reported once for the first intracranial vasculatory, vascular territory and um, the administration of a pharmacologic agent. 
And then if additional vascular territories are also treated um, with intra-arterial intra prolonged administration of a pharmacologic agent during the same section, the treatment of each additional vascular territory is reported using the 61651, and it may be reported um, for a maximum of two times per day. For pain management, um, the next section I kind of grouped together. There's pain management, ophthalmology, otolaryngology, auditory, and then special services. Um, there's only, because some of them have just a onesie uh, change, and so I just did it that way. Um, there are three new codes in the, this section <clears throat> relating to uh, paravertebral blocks. Paravertebral blocks are also known as paraspinous blocks, and continuous infusions are used for the you know, chronic, the treatment of pain management for patients undergoing thoracic breast um, and upper abdominal surgery because the procedure is performed at one or more levels or has continuous infusion using a catheter in the vertebral space, it could be in the thoracic region, um, for post-operative pain and GESA. There are multiple codes that have been established to allow for the appropriate reporting. <clears throat> Um, CPT code 64461 through CPT code 64463 were established to reflect um, these new procedures um, and it can, the thoracic para, paravertebral blocks at single or multiple levels or the continuous infusion. Um, these procedure identify the medication injection into the paravertebral area as a single injection or multiple injections. The intent is to provide a dense ipsilateral somatic and symptomatic blockade to the transmission of the nerve spur um, signaling pain. The pair to be <clears throat> the pair. Excuse me. <coughs> The um, paravertebral blocks target the sympathetic chain of nerves that transmit the um, pain signals and anyway provides a lot of coverage from the T2 to L1 area. Additional injections would be reported with the 64462 um, and these can be re uh, intended to report only once regardless of of the number of injections and whether an additional is injection is performed on the opposite side. This is due largely to the fact that these injections are usually performed unilaterally according to the anatomic location of where the surgery took place and where the pain <clears throat> um, is going to be. So it could be, um, if it's on a, the right breast, it would be on the right side. <clears throat> Ophthalmology changes. Um, these, oops. Um, in the surgery section, there was the addition of one CPT code. There were revisions of a number of codes, and then the deletion of one code. In the medicine section, um, a revision of one and addition of one, and then there was one category three code that was converted to and it's listed up in the surgery section as the addition of a code. And then there was the addition of one category three code. <clears throat> the 65785 um, implantation of the intrastomal cornea ring sec segments um, was from 0099T. It was a category three. There are revisions of the laser trabeculoplasty code, there are new exclusionary notes, and the one thing about this one is that it was a 90-day global period, and it has now been changed to a 10-day, which is pretty typical for the frequency with which they do the procedure. 
um, and they removed the description one or more sec sessions. So each time it's done, it is now reported. Um, the, um, there was changes in the descriptors on a number of other codes for where it says with and without. Um, in the repair of the retinal detachment, it was originally identified as a 90-day global period. Um, but then, for some reason, it didn't get put in, and so it has been reestablished as a 90-day global period. Um, the 67101 and the 67105, which relate to that code, have been referred to the editorial panel for 2017 because there's a lot of discussion about the global period. There are, there's um, screening, the two new codes are screening and detection for amblyopia, am, Leopia and strabismus, and a lot of it depends. They're both instrument-based. Um, there's two options. One is for whether it's remotely analyzed, and the other one is for whether it is an on-site analysis. In the otolaryngology section, there are special otolaryngologic services, vestibular function tests, audiology tests, evaluation, um, therapeutic test, cerumen removal with lavage. That was a huge discussion. We heard more about that than any of the other codes. And then there's a drug eluding um, sinus impact category 3 code and a Hicks-Fix code. <clears throat> the special um, services section, auto rhino laryngologic subsection guidelines, have been revised to more accurately describe speech, language, and swallowing, voice-related evaluation and treatment associated with these codes. The changes are more editorial in nature than um, specifically substantive. The revisions were made to better identify the kinds of procedures that are listed in this section. The previous guidelines only intended, um, listed the intended use of speech evaluation and auditory rehab status codes. And um, because additional codes that were included as part of the category were placed within the section, the guidelines um, didn't address them, and so they have now been included. And these are some of the specifics on those. Um, it is a very a specific one. The thing about the first one is the diagnostic or treatment procedures that are reported as EMM services are not reported separately. So, for example, the tuning fork and the removal of non-impacted cerumen is not separately reportable. Um, there are some guideline changes um, because these two changes are also editorial in nature. Um, they the move away. Okay, um, I'm getting We see your screen, Georgia. Uh, do you see my screen? I do. See skyline changes. Um, something just happened. I don't know what happened. Um, slide 41. OK. Are you back on? I'm on slide 41. OK, good. I don't know what happened because it, it just blacked out on me on this end. Sorry. OK. Um, the guideline changes provide a more accurate uh, listing of the codes that are included within the section. Um, a better description of the kinds of services that are included, and a better description of what is included as part of the services that are listed. The vestibular function testing, um, this is a caloric test, which means that it is warm, one um, warm water, a warm liquid, and one cool in each ear for a total of four injections. These are a new code. They've been established um, to get a better reporting. And then you'll notice 
that there are three parentheticals behind it, and then the 92538 um, is monothural, and the only difference is that it is one injection, you know, irrigation, and, and whether it is either warm or cold, um, unlike the first one, which is two. <clears throat> Um, more guideline, oops, um, autologic function test. There's a resequence code, the 92597. The 92596 is ear protector attenuation measurements. And then there's changes in parentheticals. And that's it. Okay. The cerumen removal with lavage. Um, cerumen. Sarah means wax, and then it's an impaction. There was a CPT assistant in 2005. Can you see this? The CPT assistant that I'm showing? Uh, we see your slide 44. You don't see the... Okay, well then that is not... Okay, that's the hyperlink thing that's not working. Okay, there was a CPT assistant in 2005 that really defined um, the process for removing um, cerumen, and they made a very big deal about it in the CPT this year because um, apparently there's been a fair amount of misuse of the reporting of the codes. Um, the, if it is impact, and the big word on this is impaction, there are visual considerations, qualitative, inflammatory, and quantitative. I'm not going to read them all for you. Okay. <clears throat> the, the 69209. Is um, the removal of impacted cerumen using irrigation or lavage, which can be done by a non physician. <coughs> the 69210, however, requires instrumentation, and that um, was the big difference in it. The 69209 um, was a new code that they felt was warranted to differentiate between how the impaction was removed. And sometimes the lavage, it's called that it's being cleaned out for impacted cerumen, when in fact it's not impacted. Um, there is a special equipment. Um, it's usually mechanical, and it pulsates the liquid into the ear to help flush out any of the um, buildup of wax. If it's the physician, from a documentation perspective, really has to make sure that they document that it says impacted. If it's not, it's bundled into the E and M. Um, there's a new code, uh, category three code for a drug eluding sinus implant. Um, nasal endoscopy procedure codes include the effort of performing the endoscopy, the packing, post surgery and the placement of a stent or implant. The CPT code 0406T and 0407T describe that the endoscopic placement of the implant device was performed independently of other ethmoid sinus endoscopic procedures. It wasn't, if it's done as a diagnostic procedure and then you add it in, it's included. But if the purpose of it is to go in and put the um, implant in, then it is built with the 0406T. The placement during the postoperative period, if complications occur, um, that may require reentry or treatment. Um, in these events, the services I report um, can be reported using these new established codes. Um, the placement of a drug eluding implant during a sinus surgery is therefore just what I said um, included in the procedure. Radiology had a lot of changes um, and I kind of grouped a lot of them together because of there's so many changes. There's spine x-rays, hip and pelvis x-rays, femur, the elimination of the film references, 
um, fetal MRI, small bowel and colon, colon transmit imaging. The soft tissue localization and marker placement we discussed already and in written reports. The skeletal x-rays, um, the spine, the hip, the femur, um, they're all trying to simplify and clarify the reporting x-rays, um, of all of them. And in the spine specifically for scoliosis and other um, conditions that require a lot of film taking or picture taking. The, they address changes in medical practice and they're tr trying to change the coding structure um, because there's no longer film per se and they're more into imaging. The new codes are now more specific in terms of views. Um, so for the spine, it's broken out between two or three views, four or five views, and then a minimum of six views. For the hip, pelvis, and femur, there's unilateral one view, unilateral two or three views, unilateral four, four or more views. If it's bilateral, obviously there would be two views, bilateral three or four views, bilateral more than four views. Um, film is a term that's gone by the wayside and it's now converted to images. Um, and then, so they are referring to it as either um, an analog or digital image in some form of electronic manner. And then the definition of a written report's been updated to include um, handwritten or electronic. Uh, signatures for the written reports. <clears throat> um, we talked a little bit already about uh, radiation therapy. It is, again, it is delayed until 2017 due to CMS's decision. There are basically four codes in each category. There is simple, intermediate, and complex. In a simple, it's a single treatment area with a single port or a parallel. And the codes vary accor um, according to the um, megavolts that are using, that are being used. Intermediate um, is two separate treatment areas, and there's multiple ports, and again, the codes vary by the um, megavoltage. The complex is really complex. There's three or more separate treatment areas. There's custom blocking. Um, tangential ports, wedges, rotational beams, compensators, electron beams, and they're all, all of the codes in this category also vary by megavolts. There's intensity modulated treatment delivery, there's the simulations, and then the compensator-based beam modulation. And I didn't go into a lot of it now because it is so specialized, <clears throat> but um, there is a good discussion in the CPT Insider View Changes that is on the website. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there's changes to laboratory pathology and in both the non-molecular and the molecular. The molecular I am not addressing. It is also a very specialized area, um, but there's a lot of, it's a huge section now and it's incredibly interesting, but very specialized. Pathology, um, lab changes, there's immunofluorescence, immunohistochemistry, um, structure panel, and then chemistry for the chromatography, mass spectrometry, serology, and microbiology. The, um, the MAAs that um, we've seen in prior years, which is part of the molecular have been expanded, so I won't do any more on the molecular. <clears throat> on the non-molecular side, there's immunofluorescence studies. Um, there's a revision to 88346. 8347 was deleted. There was an add-on code, 88350 added, and then there, of course, are new instructions to clarify. There is a change in the surgical pathology. I think it's a level one code se section and it's just a change in the parentheticals. The new obstruct 
obstetric panel um, is a definition of what it must include. And there is hepatitis B surface antigen screening. There's also HIV obstetric um, panel screening. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the chromatography and the mass chromatography and definitive versus presumptive drug testing because there's a lot of this relates to a lot of the pain management centers that are out there and they all do drug testing to basically see whether or not um, the patients are being compliant. A definitive drug test um, and let me just give you an, a little explanation. Um, presumptive is the old um, qualitative, which said it was a yes or no answer. And it might give you a value, but if it, it's, they call it semi-quantitative. Semi-quantitative is still qualitative. And there's a couple of really good CPT assistants out there that describe it um, so that those are ones that you want to check into. Definitive is now, this, it, they took the term quantitative and changed it to definitive. And what it does, it gives you a numeric value, but it also gives you the one thing that you have to look for is the quote cutoff range. So there's a lot of different technologies um, and CMS and the OIG and the MACs are going after um, high utilization of the billing of the quantitative codes, which are now the definitive test codes. So um, they are done, the definitive test codes are done through liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry. The presumptive testing includes a chromatography, but it's without mass spectrometry. And it does not give you the same level of results. So it's the presumptive. And these are the various um, methods that you'll see out there. And that's why I included it. There was a big discussion about it <clears throat> at CPT by the medical director from, and, I, and there's, she has a good LCD out there. I think it's Connecticut. Um, it hasn't been adopted by the other MACs, but it's out there. And you can obviously find it on the um, website. Not the CMS, but through Walter's Cruller. In medicine, there it's interesting. There's chronic care management, transitional care management, advanced care planning, prolonged services, and preventive medicine. The chronic care management codes were implemented in last year, and this year they were resequenced. There are required elements to it. Um, the patient has to have two or more chronic conditions. They are expected to last at least 12 months um, or until the death of the patient. Um, the chronic conditions place the patient at significant risk of death, acute exacerbation, decompensation, or functional decline if they're not monitored, but does it require a physician encounter all the time. And so what they want to see happen is that there is a comprehensive care plan. That wasn't me. <clears throat> There's a comprehensive care plan established that is implemented, and then it is revised and monitored. And the interesting, that they are not expected to be reported every month. It only gets report re-reported when there is a change in the patient's condition or a revision of the care plan. The thing that is interesting about it is that it's a code that can be reported for the, um, the patients receiving this, it's clinical staff time. So on the facilities for those clinics that are provider-based um, on the OPPS, it addresses this service being performed by <clears throat> the facility side or the hospital-employed um, clinical staff. So that was the change in that. The um, comment about transitional care management, it was just a reminder to say it's out there. And apparently, there's not a lot of use of it. Um, I think it's because the instructions are kind of complicated. But <clears throat> that is 
<coughs> I think we all have a little tickle. Um, that was the only, quote, change, and it was just to say it's not being used a lot. Um, advanced care planning, um, there are no coding changes. It was just changed to a status indicator A. And this is the code where um, it's talking to the patient and the family about an advanced directive. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the RUC came up with um, an RBU, a work RBU value for the 99497 of 1.5 and the 99498 of 1.4. But then again, each MAC has the ability to decide whether or not they're going to pay for it. If there is no national coverage determination on it. Um, the new codes that are out there this year are the prolonged service codes. The 99415 and 99416 are used when a prolonged E&M service is provided in the office or outpatient setting that involves um, a prolonged face-to-face -face time um, beyond the typical face-to-face -face time of the E&M service. The physician or qualified healthcare professional is present to provide the supervision of the clinical staff and the services is reported in addition to the E&M service. <clears throat> The, nine, nine, um, the prolonged clinical staff services with physician or other qualified um, health professional um, are used. The, the way the time is, it is 99415 would be used <clears throat> excuse me, to report the first hour of prolonged clinical staff time on a given date. We use the base code first. So the example would be a 99214, which is 25 minutes. Then you have to have a minimum of 45 minutes because it's the first hour. Um, and so you would have 70 minutes before you can start counting the time. If, it's, um, if there is not at least 70 minutes of the staff time performed, then you can't use the code. <clears throat> Codes 99354 through 57 are used, and you know, same thing involving direct patient care time. Um, it's the total time, so even if it's not all in one setting, it can be over um, the course of the time that the patient's in there. And I was trying to think of an occasion when this would be done, and the first thing that came to mind would be someone that's come into the office with um, asthma, and they're doing um, a lot of uh, nebulizer treatments, and it involves a lot of staff time. I would also see these codes used because it says out office or outpatient service. I would expect to see these codes like used in an urgent care center <clears throat> where they may be doing um, some kind of a treatment for the patient. Those were the only ones that I could possibly think of. Codes um, 99 in the preventive medicine section, um, the revisions just are lined up to some of the things that were originally included, included but did fail to meet the fall into the guidelines. So, in the counseling and risk factor rejection se section. It says any E&M services reported on the same date must be distinct, and the time reported, time spent providing these services may not be used as the basis for an E&M. And that's basically when you do a preventive medicine visit and a separate E&M on the same day. Um, and there's the section about the revision. Um, the um, behavioral health section change intervention codes, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, were removed from that section and the revision um, now places a cross-reference parent threat medical, um directing users to the specific codes for the behavioral change interventions. Um, and the sources for today's seminar um, are from CPT, the RBRBS 
um, symposium, CPT Insider's View, the actual CPT book, and the CMS um, final rule for the position fee schedule. I think it was published December 1st of this year. Christina, um, I suspect you have some questions or a few things. I do, um, but first I do want to show, take it just a moment to show our coding suite. So let me just switch screens. And can, Georgia, can you confirm, do you just see my Audit Revenue Resource Center screen at this point? I do. I Excellent. Do. Thanks so much. So um, I just want to take a couple moments before we answer the questions, and we'll get right into those, um, to take a look at some of the resources available within our coding suite. I've just moved into our Audit and Revenue Resource Center, which is our most comprehensive solution in our coding suite. Um, in this solution, not only do we provide coding information, but we also have reimbursement resources. Um, and tools as well as other pertinent regulatory content. Um, in this solution, because it's our top level product, we also have advanced content from the AHA and the coding clinics as well as the AMA. So some of the references that Georgianne has been using throughout the session in CPT Assistant uh, and the Insider's View. And we'll get to some of those as well. The Audit Revenue Resource Center, with all of our products, we keep you alerted as to what's happening in the industry through our daily alert feature. Uh, we send this to you via email, but it's available here, as you can see. And this is going to give is the customizable, uh, specific to my user's content and my preferences. Um, but it's going to give me updates that are happening throughout the industry. Um, and when we're updating code books and things of like that, we'll publish that information in here as well. Uh, so this is a state and a federal update, so it includes state content from LCDs and, and um, the state regulations as well. And then we provide also a second newsletter, which is called our Weekend Review, that gives you the federal updates for the prior week. It's a good synopsis of the prior week's activities, just to make sure you catch everything. Additionally, all of our users have the ability to customize their site, as I mentioned, but when they do that, they can also um, set create searches and create their own custom alerts. So similar to the standard alerts that we provide on a daily and weekly basis, I can set one up um, on a specific issue, maybe a coding change or and you're waiting for additional guidance to come out. I can actually schedule a um, search of the system and be alerted when something new comes out. So that's quite a powerful piece, feature. Now, um, in, in reviewing the annual code changes, there's always an interest in identifying what those new changes are. And in our top tiered products in our coding suite, they have a feature called Coding Supply, which allows me then to go in and search for the code set. So I could actually come in, select my current code set, identify um, that I want to see maybe all the new added codes for the year, and I would select my time period. And I'm able to quickly run that query to identify uh, my ads in this instance. But I could also do uh, changes and deletes at the same time. So now I'm looking at all my new addition co additional codes for the year. So that's a quite a, a helpful feature at this time of year when everyone's getting ready to update the charge masters and educate staff on the new coding guidelines and the new codes that are going to be effective. Um, within our coding suite, um, as I mentioned, we do give you access to those advanced titles like, um, like your CPT changes. So I can come into CPT changes, I can run a search, for instance, I might search 2016 and be able to see specifically um, some of the changes and discussion that took place in the insider's view to help me understand specifically the guidance being provided and why a change is being made. So that's a really helpful resource. Additionally, I can utilize a CPT assistant to search for changes and discussion surrounding any of those guidelines that the AMA might publish in, in the form of Q&A. And I know, Georgianne, you were trying to show one earlier, so I did pull that up for 69210, which was the um, impact of Truman and 
Um, I believe you were referencing this 2005 edition. So you can see you can go retrospectively as well. So you can understand the guidance specifically provided. From a CPT and a HCPCS perspective, my, my go-to is our Advanced Code Explorer. And that sits at the top of my product where it allows me to search for CPT and HCPCS codes in the current code set um, by, by name, by term, by code, a range of code. And then I'm, allowed, I, I'm able to find additional information out about those codes. So from a CPT and HCPCS perspective, um, I'm seeing here the actual code descriptions. Now we do sprinkle payment information throughout the system, and this is one place where that's visual. I can visualize that here on the right side of my screen. I'm seeing hospital outpatient payment rates and physician fee schedule rates specific to providers that I've chosen based on my use of our calculators. And that here I'm defining my OPPS rates for an Alabama facility and for California, specifically for physicians. Underneath each of those codes, I do have links to additional information to our current code book, which is going to reflect any chapter or section guidance in an expanded collapse format. Um, so even the coding tips that um, the AMA publishes are replicated here or on the code page. And then all of the descriptions provided by the AMA guidance, parenthetical references, reverse parentheticals. And then, as I mentioned, the payment information sprinkled on these code pages, giving me access to payment under OPPS or the physician fee schedule for this particular code. So by expanding this section, I can see that national payment information for that latest quarter. In addition to the code books, we also, because this is an advanced code explorer, we provide a lot of information just one click away. So I can click to visualize any transmittals that have mentioned, in this case, the sleep study code. And there were six. And a links to each of those six are available to me. Uh, I can search all the LCDs related to a specific state that I'm interested in based on some preferences that I set, as well as explore the coding guidance library. And the coding guidance library does include the advanced titles um, when you are in the Audit Revenue Resource Center for both CPT assistance in the insider's view as well as our coding clinic. And so those are replicated here. So if I wanted to see the two references made in coding clinic, I could just simply click that reference here and then I would get links to each of those two titles. So our code explorer is um, my little re research assistant, if you will. It allows me to find coding information, definitions, but gives me guidance from CMS, as well as official coding guidance, coverage information, and payment information in one search. Now, lastly, each year we, want to, we want, do want to explore the regulations. Uh, we do have access to your CFR and your FR. Uh, we'll give you the ability to search by citation. We publish the final rules. Um, and those are all available. We even create an ebook out of the final rule that breaks that large document down into sections so that I can jump specifically to any given section of that particular book. So I could jump into the drugs and biological section to explore. Um, lastly, I wanted to just quickly reference the fact that I can search, and as payment information is important, um, I can search by the, the CMS, the Federal Register uh, numbering system, um, to search for that current year ruling. Uh, in a simple search, but I also have an advanced search functionality. And as I mentioned earlier, I can create alerts based on my searches. So once I've um, executed that search, this is a reference to the OPPS final rule for 2016. And any, any instance where that's been mentioned, um, I can easily review those. But I also can create an alert so that if something new comes out on that topic, I can be alerted. Um, so that's a quick look at our, our Audit and Revenue Resource Center, which again is our top tier product in our um, coding suite. Next, I do want to move into our question and answer period. And we do have a few minutes, and we have a few questions in the queue. Um, but first, I'm going to switch my screen back to Georgianne. OK, Georgianne, and you can take over the screen. And if you're ready, I'll go ahead and let me know when you're ready, and we can go into questions. 
Lord Jan. Georgiana, are, we mute? are you muted, maybe? I was. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I do that all the time. <laughs> I was talking, and I'm like, what's happening? Um, could you just hold on to the screen for a few minutes? Sure, sure. It's what. ready It's ready for you when, you're, when you um, are, are ready to share. OK. OK? Um, go for the questions. All right, let's go. So um, there was a question earlier that came in that said, by supervising physicians, is this referring to the position in the office suite or other providers on collaborative agreements if they are not in the office during the encounter? Well, are you able to yeah. clarify that? Yeah, there's a, a number of documents out there that um, put out by you know some of the law firms. But what CMS has said, if, if you're the physician who did the care plan, um, and outline the plan of care for a patient and your billing incident too, you're the one that has to be the supervising physician, um, not somebody else. Because if you go back to the incident two rule, it says that, you know, it's the physician is, um, uh, the patient is under the care of a physician who sees the patient periodically. Um, so the supervising physician has to be the physician who established the care plan and who is basically in charge of the patient. So it is a huge impact on providers. Okay. And along that same lines in regards to supervising physician, are there changes in incident two billing the same are the changes the same for split shared services? Um, well split shared is on the inpatient side. And I would suspect it is going to be the same because, um, you know, that's a good question. I don't know. Let me let me get back to it. I'm not that sure. One. I have not. Yeah, I have not seen anything okay. address that specific question. Let me find out, and um, we'll post the answers, and I'll give you the source of what I found. And if I can't find anything, then I'll put that out there as well. Okay. Great. Um, Uh, another one, again, a lot of questions on the um, supervising physician. Um, oops, I just lost my question. Excuse me. I'm sorry. One second. If you, if you um, go to the CMS website and type in Incident 2 2016, they have a whole summary section on it, and I would go there first. You know, look at, because it, it's, they did a lot of explanation on the, you know, because it's from the physician fee schedule. You can also find it on the federal register. It's just hard to find it in the federal register. Okay. Um, and one one user had asked um, if incident two under physician with billing the billing physician being the supervising physician had the impression that that's the way it had always been. Well, it is, but they made a very specific point of clarifying it because there was a thing about in a group practice, mm -hmm. and you know, and it wasn't. I have to be honest with you. I had some physicians who kind of challenged it, and it's it was hard to find a hard and fast rule that said it had to be. There was innuendos, but nothing hard and fast. We now have the hard and fast, so it is out there. Okay. You know, the ones who are um, impacted by it a lot are the ones who, um, in, a, in a position like a cardiology group, where they see the patient one day and they say, you know, you should probably come back and have an echo. So they ordered the echo. One is present while the echo is being done, and then somebody does the interpretation. And so it was somebody else who was supervising the echo, but it got billed under the guy who did the interpretation, because he was, I mean, it, you know, and a lot of it has to do with the way they have their compensation program set up. So it just cut, is this whole can of worms being created. Okay. Um, one user would ask for a little bit of question on CT payment reduction, and they had the understanding that it was limited to CT scanners that 
do not meet the NEMA XR29 dose standard. Is that correct? Um, you know what? I can't say that for sure. That is okay. not what was presented at the CPT um, seminar. So I can look and make sure for you, and I'd be happy to. You know, and I'll post whatever, again, is the citation that supports whatever way it goes. Um, there were some questions around um, a user asking about the bilateral modifier 50, if it would be paid. Um, and they are saying that it's currently not allowed with 69210, even though it's instructed by the CPT book. Have you seen that? Um, I, have, I can't say that I've seen it, but am I surprised? No, because CPT doesn't necessarily, it says here's how would be the correct way to code it, but how the payers want it reported um, is a different, is a whole different animal. So um, just, and, and I, I know it's like tongue in cheek when they say, well, CPT said, but the payer guidelines, if you for billing purposes, um, you have to follow their guidelines. Okay. Um, I did um, notice some other questions about comments about what I said was not exactly the same of what was on the slide, um, largely because I didn't want to insult anybody by just reading the slides. I wanted to give you some of the story behind it. Um, the story behind all of it, you can find on the um, Insider, CPT Insider, for 2016 changes. Great. Um, Georgian, can you speak to any of the G codes related to radiation therapy? It looks like we had a question, couple questions asking about physician reporting of G codes and if there were any new ones for radiation therapy. There, you know, the new ones came out, I believe, in 2014. CMS did not implement them for 2015, and again, mm -hmm. they are not implementing them for 2016. But that's CMS. So CMS came up with the G codes. Other payers um, probably are using the codes. The codes read almost identical. They're almost identical, but you know, CMS. Um, they have their own way of doing things and why they want to do things. The original reason behind the reason they didn't go into 2015 is because they didn't get the new codes in time. There are no um, cr direct crosswalks for them so that they could, in fact, do some pricing and figure out how, how, how much it's going to really cost to provide these services. So this is going to give them um, probably a two-year track record using the G-codes so that they can price them. I think that's what's going on. And that would be specific to CMS, not to other payers. Okay. Um, there was a little confusion over the 99415 and 416 code. Um, related to the evaluation um, to the beginning of IV hydration in an office with prolonged monitoring and observation for two hours. Do you have an understanding of why the 99415 and 6 would be used instead of the hydration code? Um, I have not seen that hydration part of it with the okay. 415 and 416. Maybe. Okay. I would, maybe we I don't I'm not sure that you would use them in addition or instead of the hydration codes. Because those are if you are in fact doing hydration, you should be using the hydration codes. Okay. I I can I'll check. You know, I, I would hate to say something it just doesn't feel right to me. All right. But, you know, I can be wrong. Okay, uh, let's see what other kind of questions we have. Um, let's see here.
Could the prolonged services code be used in a cancer clinic where the patient's receiving treatment education by staff following EM visits with the physician? I think that would, and you know, it depends. The, the structure of the code, there's inpatient and there's outpatient, and it says office or outpatient setting. So it would seem appropriate, but you know, you have to remember it goes in. So the E and M code is 25 minutes if it's a 214, and then it has to be another 45 minutes, so it's greater than the 70 minutes in that example. So it's always the first hour in addition to the um, amount of time from the primary code. So um, I would just make sure that you really doc. The other thing about documenting these is you really have to document what you were doing, what you were discussion, discussing, what was going on. Um, the templated ones you see in an EMR says that you know 45 or 70 minutes were spent counseling and coordinating care with the patient or doing blah, blah, blah. It's a very generic. Um, those are being denied by the RAC, the ZPIC, and the MAC auditor, program integrity auditors. Um, because it is templated, they say the notes are cloned, and they want more specificity as to what is documented. And I think there is a um, CPT assistant or something out there from CMS, I can't remember exactly who, but it's very specific about what has to be documented, um, and it has to be unique to the patient to describe what is specifically being done, why you're doing this time. Okay, very good. Well, we are, uh, I know we have a couple more questions and we'll have to have, to, um, have you take a look at them offline because we are approaching the bottom of the hour and I know you wanted to take the screen back for a second before we close, so I'll give you the opportunity to do that. Okay. You should be able to just share your screen at this point. One second. Okay. Can't see your screen. Okay, you will. Okay, you see my screen? Yes. <laughs> Your slide, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, this is downtown Detroit from one of the top of the buildings. So I just thought it would be nice to share that with everyone along with a little holiday music. So thanks for attending and have a nice holiday. Thank you everyone for attending. This concludes our program for today.